And what's going on, guys? Taylor Plot here. We're going to talk about some interesting things happening coming up, not only this weekend, but also next weekend or uh, next week. And uh, take a look at some of the longer range things. Uh, there's still some hope if you guys want some snow. Uh, the pattern looking later on, it's 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 still there. The hope is still there. But not only is it me with the show, we're also bringing in Stephen Ray as well, the other co-host of this show. And uh, let's go ahead and just bring him on in. And uh, and what's going on, Stephen? Not much, man. I actually had a lot of uh, winter weather to talk about even this morning. Exactly. Had a little bit of surprise. We talked about that, too. Absolutely. So uh, first off, did you see any snow from the uh, snow that we were supposed to see uh, this past weekend? Uh, where I was, my house, uh, I'm not really sure. During the day while I was at work, uh, I think it changed over here. But at work, we saw a little bit of a dusting. But of course, once the once the bulk of it moved on out, it kind of melted away. But it wasn't too far away from, from us here in Huntsville where people got around uh, an inch or two of snow. And ab absolutely. And uh, down here in Reform, Alabama, they got close to three inches. However, Tuscaloosa saw a cold rain. Exactly. It was uh, it was going to be very interesting to see where that rain snow line set up. We had a really we had a good idea of a kind of a 50 mile radius or maybe even just a 25 mile radius of where that would set up. And that was going to be somewhere from Tuscaloosa up to like Coleman. And then up through the uh, the Huntsville area. Matter of fact, I believe when I went on my way to work uh, Monday morning, it honestly looked like the rain snow line just split the city of Huntsville right in half. The south side of the city really didn't see anything. While you go on the north on the west side of the city, they were actually seeing accumulating snowfall. So really, really interesting setup. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and some of those other places really got a ton of snow as well. They did, and. Uh, you know, it, it is hard to forecast snowfall, not only in the south, but it really in general uh, over seven days. Yes. And I tell you, even the models, even the global models, even though they went back and forth just a little bit, when the high resolution models came into play about three days out, they nailed that snow forecast for having this this nice little band that showed up from, say, Jackson, Mississippi, up through Starkville and Columbus and over into parts of western and northwestern Alabama. I was ver very impressed how the models, the high resolution models at least, handled that uh, that uh, winter, winter system. Absolutely. And real quick, I wanted to pull this up here. Uh, this is from the National yeah. Weather Service in Birmingham. As you can see, this right here is the actual snowfall totals. Uh, basically, if you are north of the Highway 82 corridor, you got snow. If you were south of it, unfortunately, in Alabama, you just got a cold rain. Exactly. And it just, you know, where that uh, rain snow line was going to set up. And I had a feeling that some places over towards uh, that Columbus and Reform and uh, up towards like Hackleburg and Hamilton over there in Marion County I had a feeling that somebody in that in that little strip was going to get close to, if not getting up to an exceeding three inches of snow, just the way it looked like it was all setting up. So um, I, the the accumulation forecast, at least from my point of view, and for what I was what I was seeing in the models and suggesting, along with some other colleagues in the business, it looked like we really nailed the uh, the accumulations on this. Yes. Now, here's a real interesting little thing. I don't know if you saw this or not, but uh, Columbus, Mississippi, right there on Highway 82, they are pointing out the National Weather Service in Birmingham shows that they got a good four inches of snow over there. Yeah, and we knew that there was going to be some isolated spots. Uh, I believe I sent out on, uh, I think it was Sunday, I always like to do a like the expected forecast. And then I give a little range of like a boom in the, in the bus in case, you know, Hey, if, if these little things actually pan out, it could actually be over an overachiever yes. and stuff like that. And a, a lot of people were, were, were showing is especially with the weather service that there is a possibility wherever that heavier band sets up, uh, you could get some really good snow out of this and sure yes. enough, it set up in the, in the area where we thought it, it might set up. 
Absolutely. And I'm looking at this right now, Brooksville, Mississippi, which is actually uh, along Highway 45, I'm seeing a total of four and a half inches down there. Uh, so yeah. that's rather interesting as well. Yeah, and the, we, already knew, we already knew that the higher snow totals were going to be across uh, Texas, Louisiana, and then yeah. into Mississippi. And then by the time we moved into Alabama, the system, the upper level part of the system was going to start to weaken. But we knew that there was going to be a, a fine little window there during the morning time frame from the the border from Mississippi to Alabama that the some heavier snowfall totals would move through. But I'm not at all surprised based on how this system was setting up and how it panned out that there's uh, five plus inches of snow down there in Mississippi. Uh, absolutely. And man, real quick, uh, what I really into this as well. Uh, because earlier this morning, as we were talking off the air, we actually had some freezing fog. And then, of course, we had uh, sleet falling, but the meteorologist called it grapple. Explain mm -hmm. to us the difference between grapple and sleet. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are probably confused by that. Yeah, it looks the same. And you can actually say it uh, different ways. It's kind of like that, that um, the region some some people say certain things it could be grapple or grapple which yeah, yeah. whichever whichever term you want to use but so it, it's different than sleet and it's definitely different from hell i'm pretty sure a lot of people already know that hell is just generally from yeah. thunderstorms from the updraft and the raindrop freezes about thirty thousand feet above your head so the sleet formation that is where you you're having snowfall say around twenty thousand feet or so and then there's going to be a warm layer aloft, generally around the 850 millibar level, where you find the low level jet. And that temperature will go above freezing, so that snow will melt in that little zone. And then below that, closer to the surface, it's freezing again. So that refreezes and free refreezes into an ice droplet. Grapple is is a is different than that, and it has a very interesting way it forms. So you have snow that's falling at a higher level of the atmosphere. And when it falls through uh, a column that gets, uh, it's not really slightly warmer, but it has a slightly different different temperature range in it, you get what's called supercooled water droplets. And that is water droplets that are actually able to still uh, remain a liquid when the temperature is below 32 degrees, it's below freezing. And when the snow falls through that layer of supercooled water droplets, the water droplets will attach itself to the snowflake, and then it, the snowflake immediately freezes that supercooled water droplet around it. Yeah. And so it's it's the same principle with the supercooled water droplets. It, it's just like how rain forms; it has to attach itself to a to like a little particle of dust or or little particles that are in the air. And so when you have these super cooled water droplets, well, now they're being able to attach themselves to a larger object, a snowflake. And when that happens, it loses its, it, it loses its liquid state and becomes a solid very almost instantly. So when it falls down, you'll see, oh, it, it looks it really and truly the best way to describe it. It looks like falling Dippin' Dots. If you ever had Dippin' Dots ice cream, it looks exactly like that. And it's as soft as it too. So that's how it forms. And so when it falls down, it looks like it looks like little uh, pebbles of uh, of sleet or, or hail. But it's, it's grapple when you when you hold it in your hands, you can actually kind of mold it. It's it's very soft. So it can mold into a ball and, and all sorts of sorts of things. So that's how it's formed. It's very cool because it, it involves uh, interacting with water molecules, uh, water droplets that are actually itself below freezing. That's rather interesting. And a lot of other terms while we're on uh, the severe, the, uh, I'm sorry, the winter weather is a lot of people and meteorologists talk about the wet bulb temperature. Let's go on and talk about that because the other day uh, when we had the difference between a cold rain mm -hmm. and or snow bulb definitely takes in a, a big issue to where you either see a cold rain or snow. So generally what the wet bulb is, is you have, it's the temperature that you would need to get to for uh, 
a, a lot of things to happen. So when we talk about the wet bulb, especially during during the winter time, usually that will be uh, a situation where you could you could change it over to snow or you actually just in order to get rain and rain in general. Um, because so a lot of times you'll have without really being too technical. So say you have you have a, a temperature of about 38 degrees. Yes. And dew point, the dew point is at say 30, 30 degrees. We're probably going to have a wet bulb temperature down there close to close to freezing. And so you can what can happen is you can cool the atmosphere down to that temperature and then things can can uh, can switch on over. Um, it, it, you can kind of get the do the wet bulb the same way during the during the summertime. And yes. what that will do is you have to get the temperature down to a certain point for you actually get some uh some moisture actually condensating and and stuff like that it's a very it's a very interesting uh interesting thing that that we can use and i believe let me uh i can pull up the definition of it and that kind of will give a uh a better i don't have all the, i don't have all the definitions all the definitions in my uh in my mind let me, let me, while you do that, let me just go on ahead and say this. Uh, uh, where I live in county, uh, we got to 34 over a dew point of four uh, on the day that it was supposed to snow. I think right. that was Sunday, because we down to 32 or below 32, that was the reason that Tuscaloosa saw cold rain and other places all snow right exactly and so here's a here's a better uh representation of, the, of okay. that that wet bulb so what you do is it when you have a, a temperature uh the the reading that has the uh, the mercury inside of it the the old time type of type of thermometer what you would actually do is you can do a wet soak cloth and you put it around the bottom of it, that's where you get the wet bulb, that little bulb part of the the bottom of, of the temperature. And so, at 100% relative humidity, the wet bulb temperature that is, of course, equal to the actual air temperature because you got saturation happening. The the dew point is the same as a temperature outside. That's how you actually get fog formation as well. We had freezing fog this morning, so the temperatures were in the mid 20s. So you have a temperature of 25 degrees, but you also have a dew point of 25 degrees. So when you have a lower humidity with the wet bulb temperature, the wet bulb temperature is going to be lower than what we call the dry bulb temperature. And that's because you get evaporative cooling. So that's kind of just a, a general idea of what the, uh, what the wet bulb temperature is. You got like the wet bulb and the dry bulb. So basically it's the, the temperature that you have to get to uh, in order to get the, uh, the relative humidity at, a, humidity at 100%. And so when that happens, you can get a lot more either snowfall or even rainfall because of that. Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, there is a lot about in the winter weather department and especially because we don't see that much winter weather down here. It's like, like we said, you know, there is that fine line of where is the heavy band going to set yep. up where, you know, where you're going to see the sleet and rain mix and then all, Right. Exactly. And we can get a pretty decent idea of where that might set up as we saw in the higher higher resolution models. And so you can kind of get mm -hmm. it within like a uh, depending on how the models are actually going, whether they're on the same same idea or not. But you can you can really narrow that down to about a 10 to 20 mile uh, little corridor of, of where it looks like it might set up. And uh so the the day before it looked like that was going to set up from Huntsville down to around Coleman the Jasper area down through uh Tuscaloosa County and then sure enough that's exactly where it set up I actually thought that it was going to set up a little bit further east than it actually was I thought it was going to set up a little bit further east of Huntsville but actually split the city almost in half uh during the morning yes. hours so and really what's interesting is when you get that rain snow line that sets up if you have a certain if the forcing in the upper part of the atmosphere is, is set up a certain way, even in the lower atmosphere with where the low pressure system is, you can get right where that changeover happens. That's almost where the most intense, uh, heaviest precipitation will be 
So mm-hmm. on one side of that line, you're probably going to get heavy rain happening. But on the other side of that line, you're going to get heavy snow happening as well. So, uh, and uh, earlier this morning, uh, as James Bishop said, they had enough sleet to cause travel impacts in the Louisville, Mississippi area. That was totally unexpected. It was. I saw saw what the models are trying to hint at, uh, which which really actually wasn't this. It was hinting at we could get some rain showers, maybe mixed with some with some snow at times, just because it's it's right underneath the this cold pocket aloft that we had. But it didn't it didn't really take into account how much forcing there was. And I I will say this: the fact that we had freezing fog all across this area, I think actually helped because if the temperature if the dew point was just a tad bit more dry and we didn't have any fog issues this morning, I honestly don't think that we would have seen this intense band of rain, sleet, and even all snow at times set up. I think the fact that we actually were right where our dew point and the temperature was, it gave a, a lot more um, moisture here at the at the low levels to uh, allow that upper level system to really tap into. If this had moved in during the day today, where our dew point was greatly lower than our uh, than our temperature. I don't know if you could if you got if you got enough forcing to get what we had. Um, so yeah, it definitely was unexpected. The models were hinting at, at some some sort of precipitation, and uh, a, a lot of the models were just showing that that was going to be mostly rain. With you could see some hints in there just based on some temperature profiles that you will probably get some rain and sleet and snow mixtures. But um, yeah, definitely completely unexpected. Uh, matter of fact, the Weather Service in Jackson had to do a, a quick short fused yes. uh, winter weather advisory for a good chunk of uh, western Mississippi or east, excuse me, eastern Mississippi. So I really also want to hit to hit on this as well, uh, because Jason Simpson up there in uh, in where you live in Huntsville, he hit on this uh, a couple. I think it was yesterday uh, that we are going on. I think now uh, seven consecutive days of seeing cloud cover and dreary weather here in Alabama. Yeah. Why is that the case because of this pattern that we're in? I think a lot of people want to know why can't we see the sun? So a lot of it just has to do with like what you said, the pattern that we're in. So you get a lot more uh, lower pressure systems, the troughs that we talked about moving through the, the uh, upper part of the atmosphere. The situation that we got in with this was you have when the first trough moved in, when we had mm-hmm. our, our snow event that came through, before that, you're always going to have some increased cloudiness that happens. That's because you're, you're getting a lot more moisture in the higher levels. And then as you get closer, the system gets closer, the, the yep. moisture works its way down. So you're going to get that increased cloud cover ahead of it. So you had that on Sunday. And so then on Monday, of course, we had the, the snow and the rain that moved in. Well, behind it, the atmosphere, the part of the atmosphere that has our troughs, we call it the 500 millibar level and above. That's where the majority of the weather happens, that um, uh, the, the pattern happens. And so when that moved in, you had a lot of west and northwesterly flow. So that brought in the cooler temperatures behind it. But you had a lot more, you had a lot of moisture left over in the middle part of the atmosphere. And so when your air parcel rises, up into that part of the atmosphere, you're going to get it to condense, and it's going to create that cloud cover. So there's a lot of moisture that was left over in the in the in the mid level. So when that moved in, so you still had cloud cover with that. Well, what we dealt with today was you had another part of this upper level system that moved in, and it was a cold core aloft. Kind of, it wasn't it wasn't a a true enclosed low, but it was a very deep trough that moved in. And so when that moved in, you had more moisture with it, but it was in the lower levels. Yeah. And so that's when we had your freezing fog. And then when that, when that kind of wore off, you did see some sun peek through at times, Mm -hmm. but you still had some cloud cover. That was just because you had some, you had that moisture that was still available in the mid part, 
an upper part of the atmosphere. And so that condenses and that creates your, your kind of zero cumulus clouds that we have out there today. That's giving us a, a gorgeous sunset matter of fact. Yeah. And um, so you had all that happen. And so you're just kind of in that pattern where you, you'll get waves in the atmosphere that moves through, but there's just moisture that's with it. You just got moisture that's available with it. And so when that comes in, it just condenses and makes the clouds. So, but um, we will we'll actually get some clear skies coming in uh, uh, probably even later on uh, tonight into tomorrow uh, before we get this other cold front that starts to, uh, that starts to move on through on, uh, on Thursday night into Friday. So let's go ahead and talk about the pattern change that's coming up uh, into the next week and the following week, because now this is kind of a slow week. And then the next few weeks look like it's going to be rather interesting. It could get rather interesting and uh, it, it's going to get active once again. So while we have a dry stretch, even though we did see this little uh, yeah. unexpected event happen, happen today, uh, you're going to get a really and truly the, the next pattern shift, if you will, happens happens tomorrow night into Friday. We're going to have a, a a pretty dry cold front that comes through. Any precipitation, the majority of it is going to be shunted off to the north uh, next to the uh, to the area low pressure. That's going to bring some snowfall up to the parts of the Midwest and up in the uh, Ohio Ohio Valley uh, up there. So when that moves through, there should be just a little bit of moisture available to get some wheat showers going. It's not going to be a complete washout by any means, but you probably would see some drizzles and some some light rain to take shape Thursday night to Friday. And you even might even see some some snowflakes mixed in as well. And then right. coming in on Friday itself and possibly even into into Saturday, just depending on how this upper level system uh, really works. You'll probably start to get what we call convective snow showers and flurries that develops underneath the the cold core of the, of the system, kind of like what we saw today. That was a a convective style yes. um, uh, band that that set up. You can actually see it in the satellite imagery. Had cumulus clouds that that developed with this with that band this morning. You kind of get the same thing. It's kind of what we dealt with um, several weeks ago when mm -hmm. we when models are first hinting that we would, you know, we could potentially see some, some snowfall and stuff. And we got those convective bands that set up uh, behind the, behind the area, low pressure. It's the same thing. We're going to get some convective uh, flurries and snow showers. Um, the majority of that in Tennessee, but we'll get some here in North Alabama, I believe. So that's going to usher in the, the cooler air and even some drier. So you're going to be dry Sunday, Monday, Tuesday looks to be dry as well, but getting into Wednesday and Thursday and maybe even Friday, there's some model discrepancies in, in the timing of certain things. The pattern shifts back until you get more troughs that are digging in. And just depending on where the trough set up, uh, sets up is going to be where the area low pressure actually sets up. And the models have been kind of going a little bit back and forth on this, but they look to be kind of honing in on the idea that it would be more of a a rain and storm setup, yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't expect big severe weather issues with it just based on the fact that our temperatures are probably only going to be in the upper 50s and lower 60s max. Uh, I think any severe weather issues would be confined to the coast right now as you as you look at it. But right now it looks like the trend is to have more of a rainy and some thunderstorm set up for your Wednesday into Thursday, maybe Friday. Again, just depends on how the timing works out. It looks like the models are giving us a kind of a bigger window. The GFS model is more, it has more kind of a waves that move through and then the low pressure system moves on in as opposed to the, the European model, which is just, it's dry, dry, and then boom, here comes this trough with the low pressure system moving on in. So snow lovers, I don't really think my gut's telling me that's probably not going to be one to watch as yeah. it does. It looks like it's trending into it's going to be more of a rain event. But as we head later into the the month, primarily looking at probably the uh, January 20th through the end of the end of the month. So really, was it the 13th of so seven, seven days from now yes. after we get that system in next week? probably towards the later end of the of the month 
maybe even pushed into uh, earlier parts of February. It looks like the, what what we've been watching with the with the polar vortex, it's going to start splitting. Uh, a, it's already split a little bit, but it's going. We're going to start getting a little bit more activity with uh, the low pressure systems that that are breaking off from that. And it's all due to that stratospheric warming when you get that that warming in the, the the stratosphere is is a stable layer of air so when you go up and you see a giant thunderstorm especially during the summertime yes. they can go up like 50 60 000 feet when you see where the tops are that's usually where the stratosphere starts you get what's called the tropopause and that's the layer that that separates the the troposphere which is where we are where the weather happens in the stratosphere well that stratosphere is where the temperature warms again so if you see it we'll show some soundings and stuff in, in meteorology and show you guys what the atmosphere looks like when you follow that red line it goes all the way up and all of a sudden it juts off off to the right again getting warmer that's the stratosphere so when that warms more than usual which is it, it's not it's not unheard of by any means this is not this is not a big um uh, a global a, a global warming impact it ha it this happens constantly it's it's what splits the, vol the polar vortex up so you get that stable layer air get a little bit warmer than it usually does and the polar vortex that's underneath it it starts to wobble and it starts to get unstable and then you start getting breaks in it and that's when we get our, our active weather and it looks like it's going to start diving deep into the eastern united states coming in uh towards the end of the month. What you got? That. So if you want to explain, now that was the sounding uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. But I don't, there it about, is. Okay. But you were talking about the sounding. You can kind of explain it now, now that I've pulled it up. Exactly. So what this was, is this was for that severe weather event that really didn't, didn't take shape across uh, parts of Texas and Louisiana a few weeks ago. So when you go higher up, so first off, you see where the where the lines begin. That's the that's the surface, and so you go up, and you have that little temperature inversion that had the that really uh, hindered the severe weather risk. Yes. Then you go up, and you got a little bit of a dry layer at the 500 millibar level, and that actually can help with uh, severe thunderstorm uh, formation and strength to get uh, a dry air. We call the uh, um, the mixed layer aloft, elevated mixed uh, layer, the EML. And so you keep going up and up and up, and then finally you see where the where the dew point juts off to the to the left. That's the green line, but then you see how the the uh, the red line it start it doesn't go sharply to the left. It starts gradually going up to the left, and then finally you get the dew point that rises again, and then right where it meets uh, or not meets in in general with the lines meet. But right where the both of them start to kind of go the opposite direction, yes, a bit up there. That's where you have the 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 tropopause. That's the beginning of the the stratosphere, and so you start getting warmer temperatures as you as you go on up. And so that's very rarely do we get do we get weather up there. Um, occasionally, you can get these big supercell storms what we call an overshooting top and so the, the storms just the updrafts just so intense that actually breaks through that stable layer of air and so you get the little little the anvil and then on top of it you get this little overshooting cloud and that is actually getting up into the stratosphere and that's uh during the winter time usually the stratosphere is around uh about 50 50 60 000 feet yes. but because the way the air pressure works and temperature, once you get into the summertime, that starts getting a little bit a little bit higher up because of the uh, the fact that the temperatures here in the tropos troposphere gets uh, gets warmer. So that's why you can actually see thunderstorms that get up to about seventy thousand feet yes. during the during the summertime. Very very tall. But that's that's the sounding that I'm talking about. So you get up, the weather balloon gets up, and all of a sudden you see this this very sharp increase in temperature. And that's where the, the stratosphere begins. Well, you know, you were talking about the pattern change. Let's go on ahead and talk about uh, a system that happened uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, but now this actual system, uh, 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 many years ago, 
uh, next Friday, not this Friday, but the next Friday, we actually had an EF4 tornado go through Moundville, Alabama and completely wipe the town completely off of the map on January the 22nd, 1904. Mm -hmm. There is definitely, there is always the possibility of seeing deadly long track tornadoes in the month of January. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. I mean, really and truly, we always say that our tornado season is the spring, then we have the fall tornado season, but really and truly throughout the entirety of the year, you can get tornadoes any time of the month. And especially when you get into the summer times, you get some landfalling tropical systems. And of course we get those rain bands that come through and they rotate and produce the, the shorter lived tornadoes. But I mean, we're, we're still technically in our uh, fall severe weather season that really truly ends during the the end of january february is usually our quietest month yes when uh it's at least in the winter time with tornadoes because that's usually when we have our coldest weather our coldest weather the the brunt of our winter really comes from the end of january through the middle part of february and towards the end, of, end part of february you start uh, warming back up so you can i mean you can get systems that deal with tornadoes. Matter of fact, I think you actually shared with me when we were t talking about our snow uh, threat that we had on Monday. I think it was actually a year ago that day we were under a tornado watch and dealing yeah. with a uh, uh, squall line with the potential for some tornadoes in it. So I, it's no stranger. We're no stranger to tr uh, big tornadoes in, in the month of January. So uh, definitely. So that is a uh, definite thing to keep a track on. So real quick, I've got, I pulled this back up full screen so I could pull up the new graphics uh, that you sent me uh, so that we can go ahead and talk about that pattern shift next week. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, again, if you want, if you want some winter mischief that goes on, it, the pattern that we are in, it still favors it if certain things pan out. It doesn't always have to work that way. I mean, a pattern can favor uh, uh, some winter stuff down here, and then we end up getting severe weather. It's just the way that the pattern looks, if it if certain things pan out, it it would go in favor of of some winter. So this is this is coming in. This is Wednesday night next week and this is off the european model so what we're looking at is what we call relative vorticity and yeah. so that's just basically a a fancy term for the spin in the atmosphere you can see where the troughs move in and um you can you can see we use this a lot when we watch severe weather setups to see uh how much vorticity and and stuff can happen out in what we call the warm sector yes. uh that's where you get those uh discrete supercells that have the, the big tornadoes with them. So we look at this uh, when we're watching that. But you also, you look at it for patterns and stuff like that. So what we're looking at here on Wednesday night, at least according to the European model, and the GFS does show this too, but it shows it at a different time, is you're going to get a short wave that could move through and that would kick off an area of low pressure that would be uh, moving uh, probably, uh, if it happens the way that the trough sets up, it would be forming across Mississippi and, and moving northeast into into yeah. Alabama. And so that would be a more of a rainy and, and yeah, there'll probably be some rumbles of thunder in that setup as well. But if you look at the, uh, this is the Climate Prediction Center. So they they issue things periodically through through the months and, and stuff. And it gives you kind of a, a, a range of what the pattern we're getting into would favor. And it looks like that we're going to be getting into a pattern that would give us a little bit more above average precipitation. However, uh, not, however, yeah, however yeah. around normal temperatures, so not below average, which would mean snow. Yes and no. Uh, the average, so it, above normal or around normal temperatures, if you get, so normal temperatures during the night would be closer to, to the freezing mark. So you could, if a system does move in at night, you could still get some snow uh, down across the parts of the South. But one thing that you, that will watch, and this is really catching my eye is what's happening off to the West. 
and the way that the upper upper pattern sets up the below average temps that you see off to the west that could be moving down our direction towards the end of january of course this goes out this graphic goes out in the 8 to 14 day time frame so that's the 20th through the 26th right of this month but when you get beyond the 26th towards the very end of january and even probably getting into early february you're probably going to see that below average temperature being shown by the climate prediction center moved over to the eastern united states including us down here in the south and that's part of that polar vortex that starts getting split off and so it's it's tough to tell whether or not that the the uh, above average uh, precipitation would coincide with some of that uh, that colder temperatures. It's possible, especially based on the way the pattern sets up, uh, that you can get some uh, some low pressure systems that move on in that give us some either some rain or even some snow. Uh, real quick, uh, this up here that's going through International Falls and across the Great Lakes and across uh, the far northeast, that pattern up there was absolutely wicked. Yeah, and that's that's still part of that, the just the, the overall polar vortex starting to get unstable and you yeah. get a lot more wobbles and stuff of that. So you, you will start to get troughs that will move in and, and then – a lot of them will break off and, and, and impact the Northeast. And then we get a cutoff part uh, that comes through the, through the South. Uh, especially when we start to get, um, when we get deeper into, into the month of, of January, you're probably going to start seeing a lot more of what we call deeper digging troughs. And yeah. so instead of dealing with that short wave, that looks to be moving through next uh, middle part of next week, you start to get, a, a bigger u-shaped in uh in the in the models in the in the upper part of the atmosphere now Not like this, that right there this, that looks like something for severe weather if this was in april man that would be that would be really bad if if this was if this was in the spring you were yeah. definitely looking at a potential severe weather outbreak on the eastern on the eastern side of, of this trough. So this is what's moving in this week, and this is what's bringing us that that more of that dry cold front with a small chance of a shower with it coming through uh, coming through Friday. So right. the go ahead. No, I'm just saying that that's just that's just mind blowing, man. It is. It's a it's a huge system. And again, what you're looking at with the with the colors is that's the that's the vorticity. So you're getting yeah. a maximum amount of spin that is rotating through the, the the base of that of that trough. So the cold front itself at this point would be mo would have been moved through the area and so it's going to be east of where that the purple shaded area is across Georgia and South Carolina. Right. So what you get behind it, you see this little bit of a lull in the vorticity over a majority of uh alabama you see that kind of lower values and even yeah even to the west of that so that is going to be a upper level it, it's kind of it, it's almost like another cold front that comes through and so you get one cold front that comes through and behind it you get drier air and it's gonna be a little bit cooler but then you got a, another cold front a secondary cold front that comes in behind it and that's a colder temperatures that yes. is with the main part of the upper level system and so when that comes through that should actually kick off uh, a few uh, what we call convective snow showers and flurries. A lot of it looks to be setting up across Tennessee, but I, I do think there'll be parts of northern Alabama, mainly north of probably north of US 278. So we're only talking about places like Florence and Huntsville and Scottsboro and uh, places in far northern Alabama. That should be able to kick off some some uh, kind of some interesting convective snow showers and flurries on on Friday, maybe even into Saturday too. Just just how big the system is. You can get, it, it, I could see some snow stuff, uh, nothing accumulating, but I could see some snow falling even on Saturday. Well, now if snow showers with those quick bursts, they can do a dusting in a short amount of time on how quickly and how hard the snow falls. Exactly. We kind of saw a little bit of that today in, in Pickens County with that batch that came through earlier that it actually had transitioned all all into snow. There was no sleet. There's no rain a part of it. It was just pure 100 percent snow coming down. 
and coming down good and it started accumulating on the on the grass and some right. outdoor objects so yeah you can get that and you can get those easily with these convective snow showers you can get a a quick burst it's just think of it as it's a it's a top a typical summertime thunder shower that develops it just happens to be in the form of uh, no snow exactly so uh then we go out here to uh late thursday which would yep. be uh, a week from tomorrow exactly and this is why i was talking about earlier with the timing differences between the european and the gfs here i mean you're gonna get this being uh more than a than a week away you're gonna yeah. get some timing differences it just how the the model comes to a, a solution the european model solution says you know what there's gonna be a low in rain that comes through on wednesday and yes. the gfs is like well you know what i have it coming through on on thursday you're gonna get those timing uh discrepancies but the main thing that we look at is what does the pattern look like so even though it has it a day and a, a day later it still shows that same short wave trough that that moves through and that would kick off an area low pressure that would that would move across northern mississippi into out Al into maybe northern alabama into tennessee and we would be on that warmer side of the system but it wouldn't right now it doesn't look like it would be a big strong to severe weather maker just based on right. how our temperatures are um but that would definitely be you're looking at some potential some heavy rainfall and uh maybe some rumbles of thunder in the mix as well but the the idea of a short wave trough that's moving in that idea is the same and the way that it sets up and the way that things are trending that wouldn't kick off a a low in the gulf and give us a, a snow chance that would that would give us more of a heavy rain and some thunderstorm chances and you see the the colder air up here in the pacific northwest over oregon and washington looking like it really wants to head towards the southeast again it's really pooling up up here yeah and that's just that's the goes to show that just the active pattern that we're getting into you don't really see a where we call getting into a zonal flow or even a, a, a ridge a ridge of high pressure that's what gives us the warmer temperatures and the and the sunshine and the and the really nice days uh, a zonal flow is is where the lines are straight west to east oriented and so you really don't see you don't really see much change in the temperatures your temperatures will generally become more around normal like you would see for that whatever time of the year that you're in but when right. you start to see patterns and and troughs oriented the way that they are in the pacific northwest again that's just that active pattern that we'll get back into i mean we're going to have dry days uh, i would i would probably imagine that after this system that moves in towards the middle of the week you're probably looking at some dry days maybe even through the weekend uh but just the overall bigger picture you're going to start getting uh some more troughing action that moves in you're going to get more colder shots more polar air that starts to get pulled down into the uh, continental united states um this pattern that we're getting into really favors uh some some big time uh snow potential for the the midwest so talk about like st louis chicago indianapolis up to up to cleveland um the the pattern that we get into really favors some some low pressure systems moving in and giving them some snow but if you are wanting some winter stuff that happens down here you still have hope because the pattern that it, as long as it favors colder air there's yeah. that chance that you could get a system that develops in just the perfect spot down there in the gulf of mexico and gives us a good snow it's not always guaranteed i would say that the that the majority of this pattern that we get into would would definitely favor more of that midwestern uh snow that that moves through but that's just because they're they're higher up in in latitudes and so they get better colder air that moves in and uh the way things set up but we're still in that mix as well notice for our for our viewers out there notice how on this graphic i don't know if you can see it or not uh but if you look at the southeast uh, the the lines are coming uh, from southwest to northeast. That would be warmer air coming from the Gulf of Mexico and streaming in. However, with this one, 
you see that they're going in the opposite direction and coming in from the north and going to the south. And so this one this weekend would bring in much colder air and the possibility of snow. However, this next week uh, system is going to be, we're going to be on the warmer side of it because the lines are going from the southwest to the northeast. Right. And, and a good rule of thumb, especially for, for people that are looking at this as like, you know, well, what, what am I, what am I looking at? I see it says vorticity, but you know, what is that? If you look at, if you look at the black lines, and the way the black lines are, are are oriented, that is the the 500 millibar. That's the the heights that we talk yeah. about. And um, so if you if you follow those lines and look from west to east, that's the way that the winds are going to be going to be moving. So you see down down the Gulf where you have the lines kind of leveling out. Yeah. You're going to have winds that are probably that are going to be more west to east oriented. When you go northwest of that, say across Texas, where you see the lines are, are uh, diagonal from the northwest to the southeast, yeah. that's where your winds are coming from in the middle part of the atmosphere. They're coming out of the northwest. That's what we call, that's what we call our northwesterly flow. Yep. And uh, when you deal with southerly flow or southwesterly flow, that's going to be on the east side of yep. the troughs, just like that short wave that we're dealing with coming up next week, that winds the winds are going to be more out of the out of the southwest. So you can you can look at this map and just you can just see where the winds the winds would be flowing. Especially you see right above where the the text box is, you see how it kind of the lines jut off more towards the north and to the east. And well, those winds are going to be coming from the northwest, and then they're going to be diving right down to the south. Yeah. All right, so let's go through this next thing and go to the precipitation. Yeah, and so this is going to be the GFX, DFS, and again, it's just you got these timing differences between the European model and the GFS model, which I have uh, talked about there in the in the text box. So what I didn't show is what happens before this, and so you're probably going to get some showers that would move in probably sometime late Wednesday into Thursday, and then you get this wave of low pressure that develops. Right now, the, the GFS has it right near uh, uh, south of Tunica, Mississippi, south of Memphis. Yeah. And so in this situation, you would just be dealing with some heavy rainfall, maybe some storms, probably going to get a line of some showers and storms that could develop along the cold front, like you see there along the Mississippi River down into Louisiana. But this doesn't this doesn't appear to be a big strong storm maker just because the temperatures they they aren't that warm. They're only into the upper 50s and some lower 60s. The best chance of seeing some some stronger storms would be closer to the coast, down there towards New Orleans and, and places like that. So yeah. that's the that's the GFS look, and the European has kind of the sim the similar look, but it's going to be back a day before. And so instead of Thursday evening, it has it on Wednesday evening as well. Now, and I will say this, though. As we get closer, if we get a pretty good mix of the, um, the velocity and the holicity, we could be looking at a low-key pie shear event like we had a couple of weeks ago when a tornado touched down uh, in the Birmingham metro area. And yeah, that's definitely possible. I mean, where the low is situated definitely catches your eye because it is in, it, it means that areas south and east of that, places like Jackson, Mississippi, Birmingham, Montgomery, Mobile, Hattiesburg, we're all down into the warm sector. And so that's where you would look for to see uh, strong, severe storm potential. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you're exactly right with the, the, the spin with this setup the the spin is definitely there in the atmosphere there's definitely shear present there's the storm of relative helicity would be sufficient for rotating updrafts now, now uh, i will say this though I, I will say it's not as of right now it's not a big threat but it's a non-zero right if you if if you if you look at the pattern and the trends that, that you would see, yeah, you would start having to to look at okay could there be some some stronger storms in the mix but the, the way that it looks like it's coming in and the way the high pressure system that was here previous previously is oriented a couple of days bef before this, you 
any any severe weather chance would would probably be closer to the coast because you places like Birmingham and, and Jackson and even Huntsville probably wouldn't get into the the 60s that much probably not even getting out to the upper 50s and with this European look again southeast of that you're in the warm sector but again the temperatures are in the in that very very marginal range so yeah you would be dealing with a a high cape or a, a high shear low cape setup but it would be you know okay well how much cape would there actually be right. and so right now it just it doesn't it doesn't pop out big into my eyes of you know oh this is this is definitely going to be a severe weather system it pops out as where the low is situated that you definitely would have to watch watch it uh mm -hmm. for sure but it looks it looks more like you're just be dealing with some heavy rain and and some some rumbles of thunder here and there but as always you know we're a week away so there's definitely things that can that can change but right now it definitely looks like it you're going to be dealing with some heavier rainfall potentially in the in the middle of next week but now the models between now and then could really bomb that low out and change it different places so yep. there is a definite possibility that we have to watch it it is at both for severe weather issues and yeah, I mean, still for winter mischief as well. The fact though, that the trend so far has been that it's looking more of a, of a rain issue than a, a snow issue is just because that trend has that low, uh, up, up, a, up further inland up towards right. northern Mississippi, northern Alabama. But you're exactly right. I mean, there's definitely several days before this, and we've seen how things can change. I and mean, there was one time where the uh, the model showed that it was going to be a winter storm down here, and it ended up being that, oh, we're actually dealing with a severe weather threat. That's the one that actually really didn't materialize. But wow. the models had first showed that as being a golf low, and then it quickly trended and continued to trend several days later more towards a severe weather uh situation this could do the same thing but flip that it could be okay it's looking more like a heavy rain and maybe some storms and then the model is just you know what this just continues to trend further and further south into the gulf of mexico and you're looking at uh some winter weather down here but my gut my gut just doesn't it's not overly impressed with the idea of of winter stuff with this uh it it's it, the way things look, it looks more like we're just to be dealing with at least some heavy rainfall and, and maybe maybe a storm threat later on down the road as we get closer to it. Well, man, is that all you've got? I mean, are we going to touch on anything else that you want to? Well, we, can, we can touch on what what could be happening uh, again later on in the in the month and, and maybe into into early February. I've, I've said many times that the pattern that we're that we're getting into would favor some winter stuff and we got our winter stuff for some places on monday so once the pattern the pattern shifted back into well, real quick back into okay we're going to get a little bit more of a drier stretch and we're going to get some cooler temperatures that that move on in but as we head later on into the month that's where things look to get active once again with that polar vortex starting to split off into all different little pieces and you get a lot of interesting stuff that can happen with it i would say right now the majority of the pattern favors a lot of midwestern snow and even up into the into the northeast just that's just because the way that the troughs would be moving in you would end up getting cyclogenesis that happens around like uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and, and Iowa, and you get a low pressure system that develops there and it's all cold up there. And so you get this huge snow system that moves on in. But on the flip side of that, that still favors us in a spot to where we would get colder temperatures and we can get some troughs that could could move in in the, in the perfect uh, perfect spot. Yeah. and kick off an area of low pressure out in the Gulf and it moves on up and you end up getting some some winter weather and a winter storm down here. So even though the way that things look, it would favor it would it would highly favor some stuff for the Midwest, it still favors us down here. So there's still hope alive. It's still going to get active. Um, I, so 
one of the funny things with me is so I'm born and raised down here and I love getting snow because you would get it just you wouldn't get a lot every year and every now and then you get a really good one that happens and you loved it. So when I moved up to Wyoming to be the meteorologist for the weekend up there at KGWN, uh, you dealt with snow almost on a weekly basis up there in the wintertime. And I got really tired of it, especially with how cold it was. But I'm not going to lie, back now living back down here now, I was still kind of like I didn't want snow. But I've been down here longer now again that I'm with you guys. I want the snow as much as as much as you do. I want to I want to find something in the models that gives me hope, that gives you guys hope. I know that you'll hear us that we'll we'll talk about, oh, we're looking at snow like this and it doesn't really pan out. That's just how tough it is to get a good snow down here. You it has to be it's almost perfect for for us to get some snow down here. So I try every which way to look at certain things in, in the models to give me a, a little bit of a hint. Uh, what does my gut say? I had mentioned uh, to some some colleagues of mine back in back in December when we started looking at that uh, we could be dealing, getting into a, a, a good pattern for some snow. And everything that I was seeing, it just, you know, every every little thing that I saw was just like, that's really good. That's really good. That's really good. And my gut was just like, you know what? That I think somebody in the South is going to get a snow with this setup. It's like it almost has to happen. Whether where that sets up, you didn't know because it was back in December when I was seeing this and we we're talking about it. But it was like it just the way that it looks, it just looks too perfect to not get anything. And so I honestly thought I told people was like, you know what? I I think that somebody in the South is going to get snow in January. It's just a matter of when it's a matter of where. And we got that first shot that came through across Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and even in here in Alabama. But that pattern's still alive. It, you still got some interesting stuff that could happen later on in the, in the month. I've seen some, the models that they'll, they'll, Ran, they'll they'll show a, a system here, one model run, and of course, and then the next model run, it's completely over here, and then the model run after that, it's completely gone. So you're going to get these things that that happen. But one of the things that I've noticed is you still get these little hints yeah. of things. It's like the model is trying to leave a little little breadcrumb tr trail, if you will, that the pattern still favors later on to the month getting a potential golf flow, getting something down here that that we can watch and so even though it might show it for one run yeah fingers crossed even though it might show it for for one run and then it goes away from it the next run if you look at the models as a whole over over a certain amount of days you'll see and i've noticed that it keeps hinting at you know it, it puts it here this run and then it kind of backs away from it but then the next run it's kind of back but it's over here it's just little little finer details that you can look at for what the pattern could actually entail so it's not taking the model at face value by any means that oh well, it has a golf flow there on this day so it's going to happen that's not how good forecasting works that's not how it works that the models are used as guidance model guidance and so you look at these little little things here where it's like okay it's kicking off a low here yeah, it kind of took away a little bit, but the next day it's like, okay, it's, a little, it's back a little bit. So that there's things that I'm seeing here and there that that point to that there could be there could be another chance uh, later on down the road. And I, I'm pretty sold that there's going to be at least some some system sometime, whether it's late January or or even into maybe parts of of February, that it, it's going to get some people's attention, and you're going to start getting that that snow that snow talk again um i just i don't see us getting out of the pattern that we're getting into without having at least some chance yes whether that pans out is something completely different but i do think that we're going to get to a point later on this month and into early february where you're going to have some some system that's going to catch people's eyes and uh and could be a, a good setup if it pans out so yeah finger, fingers crossed and then, of course, you get into late mid February, March, April, and May. You go into tornado season and and mm -hmm. weather down here. So exactly. And one of the things that we'll, that we're looking at is um, what's going to go on with the La Nina. Yeah. And uh, the La Nina looks to be it should be able to to weaken 
into either the mid or late part of spring. Right now, it looks like um, the the consensus is that it would be late spring. So talking about late April into May and then getting into uh, uh, into early summer, that's when it looks like it could it should weaken back into more of a, a neutral phase. So you're not dealing with an El Nino and you're not dealing with a La Nina. And so some of the things that can happen with that, that just depending on when that when that changes, uh, you can actually get some some uh, severe some decent severe weather risks uh, mm-hmm. in the south, and then moving of course off into the plains, getting into into May and into into June. So that that weakening La Nina into a neutral phase that can actually give us some 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 decent severe weather uh stuff that happens so that's something definitely to watch uh later on down the road into into the spring and on the flip side with that too it looks like we could also be dealing with another active hurricane season i i don't i don't think it would be as active as we saw this past one because that is really as active as it gets i mean you're breaking you're breaking records for name storms once we got into the greek alphabet i was one short once we got into the Greek alphabet, I thought, I think we at least get to, uh, I believe it was Kappa. I said, because that's, that's really in the middle of, yes. of the Greek alphabet. And we got to uh, Iota, I believe, mm-hmm. was the last one. And, of course, if we had one more after that, it would have been Kappa. So, I mean, it was it was so active. It was so active that, I mean, yeah. That's... that's systems hit louisiana that's that, i mean that's just almost unheard of the fact the fact that just one state had seven tropical systems hit it now not all of them were hurricanes which are good right. but the majority of our bigger hurricanes that happened just happened to hit louisiana you had laura that hit the lake charles area um you had um zeta Zeta moved on, uh, moved on in. But I think that was, uh, that was a weak. Was that that was a weak hurricane though? Maybe uh, I have to go back and look. But it's, I mean, seven in one state. I mean, I could, I could, I could hear somebody say you're going to get seven on the Gulf Coast. And yeah, uh, I'm thinking, okay, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, all in play, just kind of scattered all across. But no, it's seven in one state. Right. Now get this. Four, four hurricanes in the Gulf actually strengthened until landfall. Yeah, and one of the that bucked, that bucked the system because usually hurricanes will weaken before they hit land. Exactly, and one of the things that actually happened was very interesting is when we got into the late part of the season. So. What happens is during the summertime, of course, when we start dealing with hurricane season, the waters warm up because the sun's on a more direct angle, stuff like that. So they actually start getting some warmer ocean temperatures. But what happens when you get towards the coast, especially with the system, is when it starts moving on shore, just depending on how fast it's going. If it's going pretty fast, this won't really uh, impact it that much. But if you start getting a slower system that moves on in, you get what's called upwelling. And so you just, because of the way the low pressure system works and the wave action and the rain and the storms, you start churning up the ocean water. And so that actually cools it down because it starts bringing the colder air or colder water from beneath the surface up. It churns it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so think of it as like a, um, uh, a hot tub when you turn when you when you turn the jets on and you feel it underneath it all kind of mixes oh, up it yeah it bubbles up and it and it mixes mixes everything and so that's the same thing happens with the system so once they get closer to shore if they slow down they'll probably they'll probably weaken a bit because now you're cooling down the the, the ocean waters and that is what keeps the hurricane in the system going. It's its fuel. So if you start cooling that down, then it should start to weaken. But a lot of them did the opposite. And one of them that actually did what I thought would almost be impossible with a system like that was, I believe it was, it was the hurricane that hit Gulf Shores. Sally. The what? 
Sally. Yes, Sally, Hurricane Sally. And um, what it did was when it moved, when it moved over the, the, the shallower waters of the Gulf of Mexico, it did, it ended up doing downwelling instead of upwelling. So upwelling, of course, is where you bring in the temperatures, the, the surface cooler uh, water up to the surface. And so that takes away the, the warmer water temperatures. But like early indications on some studies I've done on it, and I know a lot of, a lot of people are going to probably do uh, some papers on this and uh, uh, show them and, and, uh, and stuff at some conventions later on, is when it moved on shore, it actually looked like it did downwelling. And so what that is, is it actually brought the warmer temperatures that were available on the surface, it pushed it down. And so then when it brought things back up, you're really just replacing it with the same type of water temperature. So if you had a temperature, say a water temperature of 83 degrees and you had upwelling, well, that temperature is going to be more like 80 or 79. But when you actually did the downwelling temperature of say 83 degrees, you're probably going to still get temperature of 83 degrees. So that actually helped it strengthen. So it went from a tropical storm to the category one and then quickly up to a category two. And I would almost bet on post analysis from the National Hurricane Center, they do this after the hurricane season is, is done. They'll go through post analysis on every single storm. And if a storm they find should have been a category higher or a category lower, they'll change the category in, in a post, uh, post look over. And I would almost almost bet you that on post review of, uh, of of Sally that it would be uh, upgraded to a, a major hurricane in a in a category three because there were definitely some indications that there was some wind gust and even some sustained winds of about 115 to 120 miles per hour, which puts it in category three strength. Yeah. So yeah, see how it just sat there and then it starts slowly moving. That's where you should start to see it weaken. But then when it right when it hit the coast, it was strengthening. If if the if the if the Gulf of Mexico's coast right there in Alabama and Florida was further north by about 50 or 100 miles, you're easily looking at a category 3 landfall with the maximum sustained winds of about 120 to 125 miles per hour just based on how it continued to strengthen the the rate at the strength that it had if that coastline was was further to the north you're looking at a major hurricane all day but still on post review i wouldn't be surprised if the hurricane center says that this is this was indeed a category three with winds of 115 uh, miles per hour because it there's definitely indications there that some places saw that type of wind. Yes. And uh, it did a lot of damage down there, my friend. It did. I was actually down there uh, just before Thanksgiving. And uh, there's just trees down everywhere. The, the, the homes, the, be the beach houses, especially the further uh, west you went on, uh, uh, what was it, Hi this, uh, Highway 1, 150 152 yes alabama 152 that goes right along the the strip there in gulf shores and, and into orange beach when you go further west going towards um uh the mobile bay area mm -hmm. there are lots and lots of beach houses that just had a lot of roof damage and you just saw tarps uh over the over the houses there was definitely some but granted it looked like they had kind of not been used for several years uh, some beach houses that weren't well kept up right. that got a lot of damage with it, but just, just because of the, the maintenance that really wasn't being put into it. So you obviously had a few of those, but even the well-built newer um, beach homes over there got a lot of roof damage out of it. And there are definitely a lot of uh, stores, a lot of restaurants and some, some houses and some businesses in Gulf Shores and Orange Beach that um, definitely saw some some significant roof damage from it. And I was one of those people. Yep. 
So, yep. anyway, well, man, I think that's going to wrap up uh, this edition of the Stingray, the, the forecast with Stingray and TP. Uh, hopefully, uh, when we do another show next week, uh, we will have a fine tune uh, and, and better uh, understanding of what's coming up uh, for the system to end the week next week. Exactly. We'll have one in the in the, the middle part of the week, and it looks like there could be there could be some that that uh, ends out the week next week. We'll have to we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, definitely. Once we get into into next week and this weekend, that system coming in midweek, we'll have probably a better idea on, on what we'll be we'll be dealing with. Absolutely. Well, guys, have a great rest of your week uh, and weekend, and we will see you back here next Wednesday only on the forecast with Stingray and TP.